are a great God and you are worthy of our worship because you have loved us, you have redeemed us through Jesus Christ. You have included us in your family that we might be sons and daughters of God. And today we're gathered here to thank you, to praise you, to tell you that we love you and to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you. So Lord, we invite you into this place. We ask that you would change us, that you'd speak to us, that you would send us out of here different because we have been in the presence of the living God. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm gonna invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Luke chapter four. Uh, Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. Uh, there's some in the pews around you look just like this. Grab one of those. Turn to page 1093. That's Luke chapter four. If you're struggling to find it in your Bible, then grab one of that out of the pew. It's page 1093. Uh, and, uh, and join us in looking at the words of Jesus. Hey, uh, before I get started, I just gotta say, uh, did you guys notice that uh, Christmas exploded all over the room? Isn't that cool? You guys like Christmas? And you know, it's going to be like this for the next month or so. So if uh, you're kind of one of those Grinches that's sitting there going, oh, I can't believe they put the lights up and the trees up and all that kind of stuff, get over it. Uh, so, because uh, we're going to celebrate the birth of Christ and we like lights and stuff. So, uh, you know, we're good with that. Hey, I got to confess something to you. Uh, I confess that I really hate boring. Uh, I just, I can't stand uh, boring because I grew up with lots of boring in my life. I don't know if any of you are like that, but, uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of school, and I tell you, I've taken a lot of boring classes. You know, anyone feel my pain out there? You know, boring classes. And, and I don't understand this because learning stuff is really cool, isn't it? I, I mean, learning is amazing. You, you're all the time, aren't you doing it? You're like, hey, I didn't know this. This is really cool. Did you guys know this? I mean, all kinds of weird stuff gets posted on Facebook because people are like, hey, I found this out, look at this. And, and, and so we like to learn, but somehow uh, we still have boring classes and, and I don't get that. Or, or when I was younger, I had lots of boring jobs. You know, it started at home, you know, because I'd do dishes, had to, you know, vacuum, had to mow the yard. And every time I tried to make them fun, I got in trouble. Some, for some reason, my parents just called it goofing off and thought that if you were enjoying it while you're working, it wasn't work. So um, I, I'm glad that I don't work for them anymore. But, uh, and especially the jobs, that there was no way to redeem some jobs, you know, because my mom was crazy and she would just kind of go, hey, I want you to wash these garbage cans so that they're clean enough to eat out of. <laughs> really? Because we never had dinner in the trash cans. Uh, just never happened, but you just couldn't make that job interesting or fun or anything. It's just, it was just a boring, tedious, stinking job. Uh, and, and of course, I did lots of church growing up. Anybody else like that in here? You did lots of church growing up? You grew up going to church all the time? A lot of you did. Okay, those of you that raised your hands or, <laughs> I know some of you are like, we're Baptists. Can we raise our hands in church? I don't, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, but um, uh, if you were like me and you went to church a whole lot, then you suffered through, endured a lot of boring sermons. Uh, I mean, they were just tedious and long, and, and you just sat there and tried to figure out things. That's why, you know, they print bulletins so you have, you know, circles to fill in while uh, we're preaching, because we want to entertain you some way or other if we can't uh, educate you. But the worst of them all were mission sermons. Anybody else feel my pain? A anybody out there? Yeah, some of you. If you grew up in church, you had the visiting missionaries, right? And they showed up, and, and they were nice people. But, man, they were really boring. And, uh, and they would set up their slide projectors and show slides. For those of you under 40, slides where they'd take pictures and they'd <laughs> shrink them down. And you could hold them up to the light and see what they were. And you put them in the this projector that, that flashed the screen up on it. Google it, okay? And because uh, this was before PowerPoint. There was a time when compute, never mind. Uh, it, so, but they would tell these stories and they weren't interesting people and they would show pictures of people that you'd never meet and they would make it sound like missions was the most boring thing at all. And, and that's why a whole generation of us grew up going, God, please don't call me to missions because I don't want to be that bored. Uh, and, and then this, this crazy thing happened. I actually went on some mission trips, started doing missions as an older teen and young adult. And, and you know what I found out is that missions 
are not boring. It's not boring at all. It's more like Indiana Jones meets Jesus Christ. I mean, because crazy stuff happens on mission trips, and there's bugs, <laughs> you know, and there's food that's weird to eat, and, and just, you know, stuff, it just is wild. And, and I went, wow, missions isn't boring. And, and then I realized that God isn't boring, even if churches try to make him that way. And, and, and he loves surprises, and he loves mystery, and he loves celebration, and, and, and Jesus, you know, he invites all of us to follow him. And, and he doesn't tell us what's next. I mean, he tells us where we're going. We're going to heaven, you know. You follow him, you get, you get to go to heaven. That's the end result. But the way there, it's full of surprises. And, he, and, he, and he, I think he says, follow me with a twinkle in his eye. Like, you got no idea what's coming next. You got, it's going oh, to hurt, but it's going to be good. And because uh, there's that whole cross thing involved and stuff, but it's, it's awesome. But he, it's surprising. And, and, and too many churches, I think, uh, and, and this just popped into my head when I was writing the sermon, too many churches kind of take Jesus and following Jesus and turn him into an amusement park ride like a merry-go-round. You know, anybody like merry-go-rounds? I don't like them. They make me sick. Uh, you know, because you get on them and you just, you don't go anywhere. And it's just round and around and around. And, and churches do that with Jesus. They, they're like, get on this ride called Jesus and we have lots of annoying music and we don't go anyplace. That's sad, because following Jesus is much more like a roller coaster. It's like a roller coaster. You guys like roller coasters? Yeah. All right, some of you are going, no, roller coasters make me sick. Uh, that, too bad. Roller, Jesus, like, following Jesus is like a roller coaster, because you get on, and there's that excitement, and, and, and it's got all kinds of things. You know, it's got the slow, <laughs> it's slow for a reason, you know, and the anticipation builds, and then there's, wah, and there's, whoosh, and you don't know where it's going, and it's all over the place, and at the end of you go, wow, that was a crazy ride. See, it's full of excitement, but it's not boring. So today, we're talking about missions. <laughs> and I pray that you'll not find it boring. And, and that maybe you'll discover how exciting it really can be in your life. Now, it begins with the message of hope. Luke chapter 4, uh, and I'm going to read verses 18 and 19. This is where Jesus begins his ministry. This is the first recorded sermon that he preaches, and it's in his home church in Nazareth. And he reads from the book of Isaiah, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sat down and he said, today this has been fulfilled in your presence. And, and he made this amazing statement and the people of his home synagogue got angry at him. In fact, they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him. When he's there proclaiming the message of hope, because did you notice the message that Jesus proclaims that he says he fulfills? It is good news to the poor. Now if you're poor, you need some good news, right? It's good news to the poor. It's liberty for the captives. That's kind of cool, because if you're in prison, you want to be set free. It's sight to the blind. It's healing and hope. It's liberty to the oppressed. Man, I don't know about you, but that sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like good news. And then he ends with this, the year of the Lord's favor. I want God's favor in my life. Do you guys want God's favor in your life? Yeah, we do. And, and see, what we're talking about is this message of hope that Jesus came to embody and to provide through his death and his resurrection, and he's given it to us. And, and this world is filled with people who are broken and hurting and addicted and hopeless, and we have the message of hope. We have the good news that Jesus Christ can change their lives. How about this, that Jesus Christ can change your life. That's the message of hope. That's what Jesus came to tell us. And, and he starts off his, his ministry by proclaiming this hope. And today we pray that you have received this message of hope. And, and, and we want you to live this message of hope. And, and we, of course we want you to proclaim it, to share it, to give away this message of hope. Because not only have we got this message of hope, but this is the mission that's entrusted to us. 
The, the message of hope is the mission that's entrusted to us. Acts chapter one, verse eight. These are the final words of Jesus in his ministry. We had the beginning sermon. This is the final. To his disciples, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. You're gonna represent me to the world. And, and I want you to think about this. God has trusted us, his children, with the most precious and powerful task in the world. Hey, when you were a Younger, didn't you love it when your parents trusted you with something? Didn't you love it when they gave you that trust? First time they tossed you the keys and said, hey, this is before a driver's license, right? Why don't you pull the car into the garage? <laughs> I will, right after I drive it around the block a couple of times. <laughs> no, you're like, I, I, I trust and you didn't want to blow it. You didn't want to like drive into the house or, or hit stuff or mess up the car. And you're just like, it, it's exciting to be trusted with something that's important. And God has trusted us with this mission of life change. And it's anything but boring because the good news of Jesus will change your life. And understand, God did not have to entrust us with this task. He's God. He could have done it any way he wanted. For instance, he's God. He could have made the stars in the sky spell out John 3, 16 in every language of the world. So then we walked outside, looked up at the night sky and went, oh, it's beautiful. What does that say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I guess I need to repent and follow Jesus. He didn't do it that way. He could have made it so that birds, when they're migrating, instead of flying like in a V, they just fly in the shape of a cross. <laughs> so wouldn't that be cool when people go, you know, I keep seeing those crosses in the sky. Maybe I need to go to that building with one on it and find out what it's all about. <laughs> My favorite way that God could have like, done the whole work of sharing the mission it, it, is this. Okay, how many of you guys have animals? You got pets, right? Okay, how many of you talk to your pets? <laughs> of course you do, stupid dog. What are you doing? <laughs> and and uh, you talk to your pets, but see, I just think it would have been really cool if one time, you know, uh, on the same day across the world, if, if your pets talked back to you. <laughs> and they said something like this. Morning, master. Do you realize that if you don't repent and trust Jesus, you're going to burn in hell for all eternity? Can I have another treat now? Uh, I'm just going, wow, talk about revival. But God didn't do that. He said, no, I'm not going to do it those ways. I'm going to give it to my sons and daughters, the people who believe in me by faith, and I'm going to let them take this mission of life change around the world and, and bless people and see life change happen. But, you know, boring church didn't always communicate it that way. I grew up in boring churches. I'm just going to tell you that right now. And, and, and the way they communicated it was this, all right, people, we have to do evangelism because Jesus said so. So we'll tell you what we're going to do. Here's our plan, because we can't think of a better one, is we're going to meet uh, on a night when Monday night football's on. And uh, <laughs> we're going to go out and knock on people's doors and uh, invite them to come to boring church and, and hear boring music and a boring sermon and, and worship a boring God like we do. And it never worked. Because God's not boring. And, and you know, and, and, and we, I was one of those who'd show up on those nights and grieve football and go knock on doors and it didn't work. And, and see, here's the truth. That doesn't work because that's not who God is. See, God allows us to participate in his incredible ministry of life change because he loves us. It's not a have to, it's a get to. And, and, and he wants us to love people in Jesus' name and invite them, dare them to follow Jesus Christ and, and enjoy this roller coaster ride of Christianity. And when you see the results, it's anything but boring. It's exciting, it's, it's thrilling, it's phenomenal. So we have this message of hope that's been entrusted to us that can change lives. What are we doing with that trust? I wanna take the, the next few minutes and, and along with the, the help of my uh, uh, partners in crime, I mean uh, co-laborers in Christ, uh, the senior pastoral staff, uh, Pastor Chet and Pastor Chad, that's the other Chad, uh, we wanna unpack what our strategy as a church looks like. And in case you're wondering, uh, no, we never planned to have the same names. We, you see, God's just full of surprises. It has a sense of humor. And, and, and if you're going, are you serious? Yes, I'm Chad and we have Chet and we have Chad, the other Chad. <laughs> you'll, you'll see him in a minute. 
But here's what, here's what we're doing as a church, and, and, and here's what I want to challenge you with. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to following Jesus, then you need to figure out how you fit in the plan, the strategy of this mission of, uh, of sharing the hope that's been given to us. So um, let me just start off by telling you this. As a church, in the last 12 months, we, as Calvary Baptist Church, have given away, outside the walls of this church, almost $300,000 to missions. Almost 300,000. Isn't that cool? And I share that with you because we've been talking about accountability and transparency and generosity for the last month. I just want you guys to know we practice what we preach here. And, and so we've taken the, the resources you've given to us and we've given them away and blessed people in a lot of different ways. So we're going to share with you how we do that. I'm going to invite uh, my co-laborers to come on up here. I thought you guys would do that when I started calling you by name. But... Uh, but anyway, our strategy begins with the community, our Jerusalem. Pastor Chet, take it away. I joined the team about nine years ago, and one of the leadership conferences that we went to, there was a, uh, a speaker that came out and made this proclamation. Would your community notice if your church disappeared? And it really challenged our thinking and my thinking on what would it look like in Havasu if Calvary disappeared, if for some reason tomorrow every one of us were no longer here and the church as we know it now was no longer here. So it changed our thinking. We want it to be noticed. Calvary wants to be noticed. That's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. We want to, if our church disappeared, for it to have a devastating effect on this community because we want to engage in this community. We've spent about 78, just a little over $78,000 in our local community. That's in the Havasu area, investing in various ministries that are listed. And that's only a few of the ministries. That's not all of them that are listed in your bulletin. Because, see, we, we believe that life change happens best in the context of small groups. So we empower each of us to go out in small groups and tell our stories. Here's a couple of the stories. Uh, 2012, NRA Banquet. Yay! Get to go and talk about weapons and fight for the rights of, of hunters. Entered into a conversation with a gentleman named Tom who was in his 70s and wanted to know, first of all, what a pastor was doing at an NRA banquet, to which I engaged in conversation, let him know I was a sportsman and I love to shoot. And, well, I'm not going there. And anyway, we started having a conversation. When he started asking questions, how can you be a sportsman and a man's man and follow Jesus Christ? It looks awful weak to me. Well, Here's a cool thing. Two months ago, a little over two months ago, this same Tom accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Amen. And unfortunately, he had a terminal illness and he passed away. But before he passed away, his beautiful bride shared with us, because of Calvary, and I'm looking at Calvary, not pastors, because of Calvary and Calvary's investment in an NRA banquet and starting a conversation Tom realized that a man's man could follow Jesus Christ and it not make him a weak person. That's community missions. Amen. We also love the, uh, the biker community. Have you noticed? You know, today uh, the bikers are going to be going by bringing tons of toys for Toys for Tots and other, other community events, 501c3s in our community. And you'll get to watch hundreds of bikes going by. Well, once a year we do what we call Iron Horse Saints. And what we do... This is a little different for Baptists to bless bikes because we're not really into that blessing inanimate objects or objects that are like that. But we chose, hey, how can we connect with the biker community? What's the best way to connect with people? Food. So we gave away food, invited folks to bring their bike, and we blessed their bike. Last year, a gentleman named Gary decided for the first time because we were sharing with him the love of Christ. Not, not beating him, sharing the love of Christ, that he needed some of that Jesus in his life and accepted Christ as his Savior. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about his journey. He decided to connect with one of our life groups, and in one of our life groups, he also shared his story of how he accepted Christ, and now we're having conversation as to his next step in the journey as to baptism will be his next step. So when you see Gary baptized, you can give an extra woo-hoo because that's community missions. A couple of weeks ago, 
on Main Street, October the 31st. Over 100 volunteers, 14 game booths. We spent three hours playing with the kids of this community and literally giving out a ton, right at a ton, 2,000 pounds of candy. And folks kept asking the question, why do you do this? And it opened the door for conversation to say, hey, we're followers of Jesus Christ. We want to share the love in this community because our mission is leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We're loving on you, and we're going to share the truth of God's word. That opens the avenue for every single one in this community to continue to have conversation as to why you follow Jesus Christ here in Havasu. That's Community Missions. Amen. So if Community Missions is the Jerusalem of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, then our regional missions is the Judea and Samaria of that passage. And so we do a lot of regional missions. Um, and, and I don't know about you, but I grew up in a church where uh, we didn't do a whole lot of community work. We didn't do anything in the little town that I grew up in. But my first mission experience was a regional mission trip. Uh, we went to Mexico when I was a freshman in high school. And I remember very distinctly going to Mexico, doing the long drive down to Mexico, uh, getting to the orphanage that we were staying at and working with. And I remember we took too many people for the number of beds that they had available at the orphanage for us. And so four of us high school guys got to stay the night, uh, the entire week we were there, in a little shed out on the outskirts of the property that this orphanage owned. And I remember very distinctively walking in uh, with a couple of the adults, and we were kind of looking around, getting everything set up, and a rather large, well, in American terms, a massive cockroach runs across the floor of this little shed that we're staying in. And I remember the, one of the adults that was with us stomped on the cockroach, picked his foot up, and the cockroach kept going. It was at that moment that I thought, why am I here? What am I doing in Mexico? Why couldn't I stay at home where I know the cockroaches are much smaller if there are any? And it freaked me out for a minute. But the flip side of that is I also distinctively remember story after story after story of life change that happened on that trip. I remember very distinctively coming in contact with people and through the ministry that we were doing, seeing their lives changed for Jesus Christ. Uh, I heard a pastor say one time, there's something about taking people on a trip in the name of Jesus Christ that opens the door for Jesus to work in their life. There's something that can be said for taking a group of people on a mission trip, a regional mission trip. And we have a great opportunity. We have several opportunities here at Calvary to do that. And as the family and youth pastor here at Calvary, I have a passion not just for our adults to go and do a mission trip and see God change their lives as a result of that, but I want to see our children and our youth go on mission trips as well. And we have many opportunities for you and your children, your grandchildren, to go on mission trips. We aren't a church that just sends adults. We want our children and our teenagers to go as well. Peach Springs is a great example of that. Uh, and as a little plug, don't forget, next week at 7.15, next Saturday morning, we're going to Peach Springs. Uh, so if you want to come with us, just be here at the church at 7.15. We'll all go up to Peach Springs and have a great time doing it. But Peach Springs is a great example of an opportunity where you can take your entire family to go and minister and do mission work. You can take your little kids, your teenagers, uh, whatever you've got in your family, you can bring them with you because Peach Springs and the Idaho trip this summer and San Luis, Mexico, those are all opportunities where an entire family can do and do the work of Jesus Christ. Let's face it, we live in a society today where the society teaches us to focus on ourselves. Do what you can do to get the things that you want. We live in an entitled society today. And doing mission work teaches our kids and teaches us that it's not about us. That is a great opportunity for us to see that we need to be looking out for God. We need to love him first and love others as ourselves. 
and that we come third in that priority list. Missions is an opportunity for us to do that and to be an example to our kids about how we're supposed to live. So, so I encourage you, check out some of these mission trips and bring your family. Don't just sign yourself up and leave your kids at home. Bring your kids with you so that they can see the work of Jesus Christ in the lives of others and can see that it's not just about them. They are not the only person in their universe, but there are people that we can go out and touch with the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Of course, we start in our community, we go to our region, and uh, we also are entrusted with responsibility for the world. For the world. And, and uh, I remember when I, I started here at, at Calvary, and we started talking about the very first mission trip back in 1993, and uh, there were some people who wanted to know why we needed to go someplace else uh, when there were plenty of lost people right here in Lake Havasu City to reach. And, uh, and I explained to them what now is, is embodied so wonderfully in that uh, Ford commercial of and. You know, you know the commercial I'm talking about? If you don't, watch TV more. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and they talk about sweet or sour chicken, uh, and we'd prefer sweet and sour chicken. And guess what? Emissions is and. It's here and the region and the world because that's where Jesus sent us. And so we do all of the above, and, and uh, you're already a part of World Missions, whether you realize it or not. If you give anything at all to this ministry, this church, then a portion of that already goes uh, to support the, the Southern Baptist missionaries that are serving all over the world. All over the world. We, because we're a Southern Baptist church, we partner with about 40,000 other churches to support 5,000 missionaries uh, internationally uh, in almost every country that will let us be there and some that won't. And you're already contributing. You're already part of that. In fact, right now we have a, an offering, a Lottie Moon Christmas offering that goes 100% to support those missionaries. If you wanna, wanna help them out, that's a way to do that. Uh, but we also support missions directly. We have relationships with missionaries on the ground from Mexico to Honduras to Greece to Albania to Africa. And, and, and we're involved and engaged in their lives uh, and, and know what's going on and wanna take trips to serve with them. Let me tell you about a couple of opportunities. Uh, first of all, we are, are committed to a multi-year partnership in Saranda, Albania. Uh, you, have, you don't know what Saranda, Albania is like. I've been there. I checked it out this summer, and we set up these ongoing partnerships. We're going to take groups because here's the thing. Saranda is a town a lot like Lake Havasu City. It's a resort city, and, and they're on the Ionian Sea. Uh, if you really want to know where that is, find Italy. Find the boot on the heel of, of Italy, that, that, the, the end point of that. Right across that little body of water is Saranda, Albania. It's a beautiful tropical place, and in the year round, they have 40,000 residents. In the summers, they have 100,000, and because and, everybody comes there to vacation on the sea. And 40,000 year round residents, they have four evangelical churches, churches that are preaching Jesus Christ and life change. Those four churches combined on a Sunday morning have less than 200 people attending them. Yeah, that means 200 Christians in a town of 40,000 people. And those churches are struggling, and we're going to partner with all those churches, all of them. And we want to invade their city and bring the light of Jesus Christ with us, and we want to teach those churches how to do there what we've been doing here. And, and just equip them to love and to serve and to proclaim and to celebrate Jesus Christ. And, and, uh, and so we're committed to doing that. This summer, Pastor Chet is going to be taking a group there, doing vacation Bible school, doing some building, some construction work in the community, uh, kind of like we do around here, and doing the, the community feeding feast events, uh, just to let people know that, that Christ is real and there's a church there that loves them. And, and so if you want to go, that's a great opportunity. And, and then the year following, 2015, Pastor O.C. is going to take a group there and do a youth, uh, citywide youth crusade in that town. So, you know, we want to make a footprint on the world. Because Jesus has told us to go and make disciples everywhere. Everywhere. And we're going to do that. Uh, let me tell you how you can participate. Let me tell you some ways that, uh, that you can be involved in this. Because remember, I ask you this question. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what are you going to do? How are you going to engage this message of hope, this mission of life change that's been entrusted to us? And so I don't care if you take on one of these or all of these. Figure out what your role in this is. Number one, you can pray. If you want to make a difference, you can pray. In your bulletin, we've listed the names of the missions and the missionaries that we support. And I challenge you to pray for those people by name. These are our partners in Christ. 
And you can pray for those countries, those cities, those places, and ask for God to do an amazing work there. Secondly, you can give. That's right, we're gonna get to that point. Give as God lays on your heart. There's lots of ways you can give. I already told you, if you contribute to this church, you're already given 20% of every dollar that you give goes away to do missions. But you can do more than that. You can give to the offering, the, the Christmas offering, to support missionaries around the world. Maybe you want to do something a little more specific. Maybe God's blessed you, and you've got some resources that you want to use for his kingdom in a dramatic way. Let me tell you about two opportunities. Uh, you guys know we're in the process of raising money to build a church for us called Sweetwater Crossing. We, we want to go over here and on Sweetwater across the highway, build a, a new church building to, to hold us because, praise God, we're, we're busting at the seams. Well, we're not just committed to building a, a church for Calvary. We're committed to building the kingdom of God. And so we want to build two more churches while we're building ours. In Saranda, the, the, the main church that we're working with bought an old building and they're renovating it and they cannot yet use it for worship. And it it's gonna take about $15,000 for them to finish that building to make it usable for the weekend worship. And, and maybe one or more of you go, I want to make that happen. I, I want to see that church completed and built. Then give as God leads you to give. Uh, another way you can do that is to, uh, we, in the ministry in San Luis, Mexico, it's regional, but in that ministry there, we want to build a mission church that contains a kitchen so that they can feed the children of their neighborhood. Right now, once a week, about 200 adults and kids show up for bread. And they get a chance to preach, and they get a chance to do stuff for the kids, but about 200 people are coming for just bread. And we thought, how powerful would it be if we put a church there where people could come and worship and where they could feed the children of that community every day of the week? It's gonna cost about $30,000. Maybe one or more of you wants to see that happen. You wanna go, I wanna make a difference in that community. And maybe you're thinking, I wanna give to that and then I wanna go down there and help dedicate that building when it is committed to Christ to be used for his kingdom. That's a way you can make a difference. One more way in giving, you can make a huge difference in somebody's life is you can sponsor somebody to go on one of these trips. I just told you we're gonna send a bunch of teenagers over to Albania in 2015. It's gonna cost each one of them a couple grand. They do not have the money, I promise you, right now. I don't know many teenagers walking around with a couple thousand dollars in their pocket. So I wanna challenge you, if you can't go or don't want to go, how about you send somebody else and make a difference in their life? OC talked about how going on a mission trip changed his life. Let me just tell you something. Uh, about 26 years ago, a lady that I had met once paid for me to go on a mission trip to Kenya. And that mission trip changed my life and my ministry to this day. And, and in fact, even though she's in heaven with Jesus right now, she's still reaping the rewards from that investment in my life, sending me on that trip. And I just think that it's a great way to prepare the next generation to lead, to invest in them and say, I want to change the life of a, of a student. I want to change the life of a young adult. I want to see God work in them. Perhaps that's what God wants you to do. Finally, you can go. You can go. You can participate by going in one of these trips. Whether it's the, the trip to Peach Springs on the Wallapai Indian Nation next Saturday, it doesn't cost you anything. Just show up and go bless people. Or, or whether it's going down to Mexico for a weekend, or whether it's going with Chet uh, to Albania next summer, or, or next fall we're going to Thailand and doing medical missions with one of our Southern Baptist missionaries that we've been supporting for decades. Or maybe, <laughs> this is a hard sell, Idaho in July. What do you think? You know, Idaho in July. Drive your, uh, yeah, it'll be really cool. Drive your RV up there, park it there, and bless people in the name of Christ. See, all of those are possibilities and more. The question is, how are you going to engage in this mission of life change? How are you going to proclaim the message of hope that Jesus Christ offers life? In fact, when you leave today, there's tables set up out front. You can stop by and pick up information about the mission trips. You can uh, sign up and get information and, and, and say, hey, I'm praying about going, and maybe uh, I'm one of those on that team. I'd encourage you to stop by, and if something interests you, even if it's just a little bit, Take one of those uh, information sheets and start praying, God, do you want me to be a part of this ministry? And if so, how? You see, we've been entrusted with this. The question is, what are we going to do to honor Christ? Are we gonna engage in this worldwide, eternal life mission of Christ? Because if you do, you're gonna find out it's exciting. It's exciting. 
Or are you just going to sit there and kind of be bored? It's your choice. You got to decide. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for including us in this mission of life change. We knew you didn't have to do it, but you have trusted us with people and you've trusted us with this message of hope. And and God, we want to be faithful as a church and we want to be faithful as individuals to do what you've called us to do. And so Lord, some uh, in this room right now are chomping at the bit. They can't wait to make a difference in people's lives. And others, it's the first time they've ever really considered it. I pray that you'd give us wisdom and courage and lead us to make a difference for you. God, thanks again for loving us. Thanks for changing our lives and saving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and celebrate our God.